If you liked the 7PRC Freedom Rifle build, you're going to love the 338 follow up. Gavin you here from ultimatereloader.com. That's right. Recently, I built the Bat HR Freedom Rifle. This thing is absolutely awesome. You're going to want to check out the full story, but I'll give you the cliff notes here. This rifle is built on a Bat HR long action. We've got an MDT ESS chassis system, Bartline 1 and 8 twist barrel at 28 inches finished length. I was using the JGS reamer and gauge kit that Hornady sent out as a preview for 7PRC and we've got a custom Cerakote job. This is FDE. The chassis actually came FDE. I did Cerakote on the barreled action essentially and the magazine and also did some really cool laser engraving and this thing is a tack driver. The first three shots on paper went into a group that measured in the threes. It was like 0.36 or something like that. This thing is absolutely a laser beam and actually I put this equipment package together with the intention of building this 338 Lapua Magnum in partnership with Treble Gun Tools. Well, it took a little bit longer than I expected to get the reamers and gauges, so I did the 7PRC build first. But now it's time to spin up a barrel. This is a Bartline 338 barrel that I'm going to finish to 26 inches finished length and it will be a great follow-up. A lot of similarities here, Bartline barrel blanks in both cases. This time we're stepping up to a 338. This is my first 338 build. I'm really excited about it. I have a bolt section with the 338 bolt face. This one is your standard Magnum that you'd have for a 300 Win Mag or a 7 Rem Mag or whatever it is that you're using. This is the 338 bolt face bolt section and that's the great thing about the modular bolt system that's inherent with and included with most bat actions. Totally love the versatility that we get with that system. Okay, so some things that are unique to this build is we're going to be using treble dies with inch and a quarter threads. It's pretty cool. I have an Area 419 hybrid tool head here and you can see we can screw those inch and a quarter dies in and then we have holes that are also the standard 7 8 14. These dies are sold exclusively at Creedmoor Sports and they provided the dies for this project. So if you're looking for super high quality dies and you want the absolute best, you're going to want Treble and you're going to want to get those from Creedmoor Sports. And in terms of the tooling package, we have, you've seen this before, like my 6.5x47 build, the EVH rifle, the bench rest rifle. We've got a treble minimum finisher. This is the body and the neck area. I've got a separate throater die so that I can dial in the free bore that I want for this particular build. And that's going to be based on the components. I've got OTM Tactical 300 green, 338 bullets. I've also got some Lapua bullets here. I haven't used Lapua bullets before. We've shot plenty of their rimfire ammo. This is the 338 300 grain hollow point boat tail scenar. That should be interesting to compare. So 300 grain in both cases. I'm sure we'll be doing other bullets as well, but this should get us started. We've also got brand new Lapua brass. So back to the free bore. We can calculate exactly where we want to be with bullet seating depth. And I'm going to be doing some research. If you have specific feedback for me on that, this being my first 338, please drop a comment and let me know what you're using for cartridge overall length, bullet seating depth, jump, that kind of thing, so that I can take a good hard look at this. So we've also got treble go and no-go gauges, and then we have this lands gauge as well. So if you want to see where your headspace is, you can put the gauge in, close the bolt, and use go and no-go respectively to make sure that you're within bounds. This lands gauge has a taper here where the throat is and that's going to enable us to precisely dial in where that throat is and what our corresponding free bore is and my intention is on the lathe I can also check stick out on the gauge compare it with the traditional uh, go and no go gauges and and with that calculate where my free bore is going to be with respect to the CIP specification so 
This is pretty cool. I'm excited about doing this build. I've wanted to do a 338 Lapua for a long time, and that time has now come. Like with the 7PRC build, I'm going to be making a rigid reamer holder on the lathe. This is the best way to get the best hold on the reamer and also to ensure complete alignment, perfectly aligned reamer to the spinning barrel in the lathe. And that is accomplished with using the tooling on the headstock side, putting this Morse taper number four, in the case of the TL1660, I'm using the, the lathe here, in the tailstock, drilling and then single point boring and then uh, burnishing and or polishing in place. So literally, we could have a tailstock that's 20 thousandths of an inch high and we would still be dead on with this kind of a setup. And then when you have that perfect kind of alignment to hold the tooling really rigidly is gonna ensure we get the best possible cut. This is a trick that I learned from Bruce Tom. You're gonna wanna check out the complete chambering video we did over in his shop. I've also got the Banish 46 suppressor with three quarter by 24 direct thread mount. So I've got two options with and without an adapter. I'm gonna do a separate video on the Banish 338. We'll do kind of a full review on that to take a look at that suppressor. This is just an absolutely awesome project and the time is now. I'm gonna go over, finish my research before making some cuts. I'm gonna make my rigid reamer holder and I'm gonna spin up this barrel. In this video, I will show the results of that process and then we'll get to low development, long range shooting and some other fun in successive installments in this series. So I'm off to go do some lathe work. Hey guys, this is a gunsmithing video, so I wanted to take a quick moment to talk about the Sonoran Desert Institute. If you're wanting to start or advance your gunsmithing career and you need to do it from home, definitely check out sdi.edu slash GavinTube. That's right, that's our landing page over at the Sonoran Desert Institute. They've got a degree program, they've got a certificate program, so depending on the depth of knowledge that you need, and what skills you're looking for, they've got you covered. sdi.edu slash GavinTube. Now back to our scheduled programming. Well, here it is, the completed 338 Lapua rendition of the Ultimate Reloader Freedom Rifle. This thing turned out great. I've already test fired it. And before we get into the barrel work specifics, let's talk tooling real quick. I've got my handy dandy Precision Matthews TL1660 lathe. This thing is a monster. It's got capacity, it's got rigidity, it runs super smooth. I absolutely love the features. I can shift between metric and English threading, for instance. It's got a lot of uh, bang for the buck for this particular lathe. And it handles the true bore alignment system incredibly well. This is an articulating chuck that allows you angular and radial adjustment, and it helps to dial in your barrels You've got the even support and clamping power of a six jaw chuck. And with that, I use the SSG range rods to get things dialed. And then I do a double check with an indicator in the lands and grooves to make sure everything is good. I've also recently prototyped a completely standalone pressure flush system, which is a really great addition to the lathe and adds a lot of efficiency to the process of chambering a barrel. So I've also got my new and improved Cerakote booth, which I'll talk about when we get to the Cerakote portion of this build as well. In there, I've got the Light Armor LA25 oven. This is a really great bang for the buck oven. And if you use the code oven125 for any oven with a circulating fan, you get $125 off. It's the best deal running. And then finally, I've got the Short Action Customs modular barrel vise. I used it on the 7PRC rendition, used it to swap out barrels really, really great barrel vise. Okay, specifically for this build, we've got the Treble 338 Lapua body and neck reamer. We've got a separate Treble freebore reamer. And then we've got three gauges. We've got the Treble go gauge for 338 Lapua, the corresponding no-go gauge, and the lands gauge, which we can use to ensure that we've got proper freebore clearance. And then also on the lathe when we're cutting the free bore separately, we can use that as a reference to check what depth we need to cut to. Really, really good stuff. I've also completed the 12 millimeter rigid reamer holder for 
the body and neck rim were used for this particular build and that worked phenomenally well. The cutting, super smooth. None of that noise that you don't want when you have non-rigid and whacked out tooling situations going on like chatter or, or other phenomenon like that. I've also got this 5 8 24 barrel extension. This is how I can get a hold on the end of the barrel to support it because this TL1660 has a longer spindle than the PM1440, which you've seen in a ton of my other videos. And then it also gives us a way to blow compressed air through the barrel and the swivel for the pressure flush system goes right onto this 5 8 24 muzzle. This is a cut down barrel that I made this from. Now, for this build, we've got three quarter 24 threads. So on this lathe, I made an adapter that goes from three quarter 24 to 5 8 24. And with this adapter, we can use this barrel extension on a lathe and it accommodates this really great. So that is the tooling that was specifically put in place for this particular build and acquired for this particular build. Okay, so again, in woodworking, you measure twice and you cut once. When it comes to chambering a rifle and metal work in general, you're gonna do analysis, you're gonna do calculations, you're gonna measure five times and then go ahead and cut. It is a little overwhelming sometimes because in this particular case, you've got the CIP standard for 338 Lapua, which is its native standard. And then you also have SAMI documentation that gives you kind of the US equivalent and that has to be double checked and reconciled because I want to make sure everything is up to spec and that we're going to be good to go in the end. And when I go to make my cuts and do my machining on the lathe that I'm completely confident with that. I've also got the Bat HR tenon print, which gives me the dimensions to turn the tenon to, the threading dimensions, the tenon length dimension, even reamer stick out that you can uh, expect when it comes to cutting the depth of the chamber. Okay. Then muzzle threads, I had a couple choices, 5 8 24 or 3 quarters 24, and I went with 3 quarters 24 because that gives you a bit more meat uh, on the barrel. It seems to be a standard somewhat for 338 Lapua rifles. There's a few different threadings that I've seen, and I thought that would be a good one to go with. And I also have the adapter, the threaded end cap, the direct mount adapter for the Banish 46 suppressor. I got the Type Pro. Uh, three 338 five port break from Salmon River Solutions with three quarters 24. So in that way, I'm good to go. I also calculate what my pre-drill needs to be for uh, getting ready for indicating the barrel and prior to chambering. And this removes the bulk of the material from the area that will become the chamber. And the critical thing there is you want a diameter that's gonna be about 30 thousandths of an inch under the shoulder transition, the larger port of, por portion of the shoulder. And then you want a depth that's gonna be at least uh, 0.1 inches back from where that uh, shoulder transition will start in the chamber. And so you just wanna be <laughs> check, double check, triple check. In this case, it turned out to be exactly a half inch that I used to, uh, to pre-bore, to pre-drill that chamber area. Okay. And then the chamber cut depth, and this is gonna be from, what I typically do is I cut the tenon to length, I look at where the shoulder transition on the reamer is, get a really up close look at where that starts to go in, zero the tailstock DRO, and then you know anything in, in addition to that is kind of your reference cut depth, and you'll check with your go gauge to make sure that you're in the right vicinity there. And then finally, I created a dummy cartridge by slitting the neck of a brand new piece of brass and putting the corresponding bullet in, taking a bunch of measurements for cartridge overall length, base to O-drive, those sorts of things, uh, to see where I wanted to be. And then to confirm that with what Treble uses with their lands gauge, it turned out that was going to be fine. 338 Lapo seems to like a lot of jump. I think I calculated I'll have about 160 thousandths approximately, and I can load it longer than that. I can load it shorter for more jump but that gives me that flexibility to be in the right overall range. So there's uh, the first time you go to do a bit of particular chambering or the first time you go to use a particular tooling package, there could be a lot of analysis and I like to write it all down on paper and then I save it in a file. 
Next time we go to Chamber 338 Lapua with this tooling with the tree bull reamers, I'm gonna know exactly where I'm gonna need to be. And that's what you want. Okay, so part one of the machining, threading the muzzle. Why do we do that first? For a couple of reasons. First, we wanna use this barrel extension. And we also established the overall barrel length. In this case, finished barrel length was 26 inches. So I started by parting off. And after parting off that inch, we turned down the tenon. In this case, it was three quarters of an inch. We cut the thread relief groove. Uh, we cut the, the step down, which is where your threaded muzzle device will self-center before it starts to engage the threads. Uh, we face it to length, thread it, and then cut uh, the recess and crown. I just do a flat profile here. You can do an 11 degree crown if you want. Um, it's not super critical for, for something like this. So at this point, we can remove the barrel from the lathe. You will note uh, here in this picture, I have a 3D printed prototype of a bushing that is straight on the outside and tapered on the inside that we can use to support the barrel in the lathe evenly without having to use shim stock. And it also protects the barrel. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, so the breech end is part two. And here we're gonna pre-drill, uh, which removes the bulk of the chamber material. Again, I said that was half inch drill bit I used, which is pretty funny that it aligns right on a half inch. Uh, we do a final dial, which is gonna uh, involve reading the lands and grooves with a 10 thousandth indicator to make sure that we're on uh, turning the tenon, threading the tenon, uh, cutting the chamber. So this is part one of cutting the chamber, which is the body and neck area. And then uh, we take a look at the transitions. And that can happen in the second step. So part two is uh, we check our go gauge stick out to see where we landed, right? I've already threaded on the action. I've already closed the action and I've established where I want to be with that depth. We then measure how far the, that particular go gauge is sticking out that gives us a base, baseline reference. If we use what Treble recommends for freebore at that point, we'll have the same stick out with the lance gauge. And of course we can adjust that for shallower or deeper freebore cut uh, as appropriate based on the dummy cartridge that you know, you've put together, based on research that you've done online and so on and so forth. So there's quite a few things to consider here, but once you decide on all that, it's pretty straightforward. I don't use pressure flush for freebore. I just apply some Viper's Venom to the bore and to the reamer, and we're, we're not removing a whole lot of material here, so the, the flutes don't even really pack up that much. And we can quickly remove those, those chips between each successive pass. Okay, so once we establish that we're where we wanna be, again, I threaded the action on, I closed it, and we were uh, not closing, and then we cut a few more thousandths, then we're closing, okay, that's where we wanna be, that sort of thing. Uh, polish the chamber, and then we can also cut the chamber entrance and chamfer at this point if we didn't already do that after doing the body and neck area chamber reaming. Okay, so that sounds like a lot, and it, it can be a lot the first time you go through it, and as you're establishing kind of your moves with your tooling. Part of what I put together here is I have the carriage at a particular reference location and I move the tailstock up until it contacts it. I've got my DRO zeroed, right? So if I am going too fast with the tailstock and I bump the carriage off a little bit, a couple tenths, I can actually correct that. And then when the tailstock is DRO is zeroed, then you've got an absolute reference. You can pull everything out, check stuff, you know, whether it be checking headspace or checking for run out, whatever it is. You move the tailstock back up to the carriage, it's at zero, you clamp it, and then you know your tailstock DRO value is still reading true and is valid. So that's a really important part of the process. Another one of these things that I picked up from uh, Bruce Tom over at his shop and, and used from his method, which is, is pretty cool. Okay, so at this part, at this time, we are done with the barrel job. Now it's time to go on to Cerakote. And what I'm doing here is I'm essentially matching the Cerakote job that I did on the entire barreled action for the seven PRC rifle, but this time we're just doing the barrel and we're also doing the SRS Type Pro 3 break. And my philosophy with Cerakoting is I only put Cerakote on parts that I want 
Cerakote on. So in this particular case, we're not Cerakoting the tendon threads. We're not Cerakoting the muzzle threads or the shoulder area. And so one thing that you can do to accomplish that is you can use the brake itself as a masking device, both for the sandblasting and for the actual Cerakote application. And that's exactly what I did this time. I machined a sleeve to go over the barrel tenon threads on the receiver side, on the breech side, and I ran uh, MIG welding wire up through. It's copper coated out the top. I masked off the crown area and the end of the muzzle screwed the muzzle brake on, which is going to mask off the shoulder area and the threads. Blasted everything in the sandblaster, then took everything completely apart and blew it out with compressed air. Super important step because you want to get all that blasting media, which is 100 grit aluminum oxide, out of anywhere where it could come out and deposit itself on the wet Cerakote. Yes, it takes extra time. Before I sandblasted, I did a full dip in acetone. I have the Cerakote uh, complete tank, which is really awesome. It's got kind of a basket. You can lift the basket out of the, uh, of the acetone and then put all your parts in and then lower it. I waited about a half an hour, raised it up, let everything drip dry for a while and then blew it off with compressed air. Then it's into the, into the sandblaster. So these steps are all things that I learned at the training that I took at Cerakote. If you're interested in becoming a pro at Cerakote, I would highly recommend that you get on the list and take their training. It's going to save you a lot of time, a lot of money, and it's going to elevate your results for sure. Okay. So now that we've blast, blasted, we've unmasked, we have blown off all the blasting media and reassembled all of our masking, which includes remasking the crown area. I did use a plug from the Cerakote plug kit and fed the wire through it. Everything is looking good. We hang it and then go ahead and mix the Cerakote. I've got the new EJ3000 scale from Cambridge Environmental works really, really good. <laughs> Way better than the scale that I had before because this is purpose built for that weight range and A&D is, is top notch. It's actually a balance, it's not even a scale, right? Uh, I also added the Harbor Freight paint shaker. I know it sounds funny. I went to Cerakote to take the training and I was like, what are they using for a paint shaker? You know, because I'm a little reticent to buy Harbor Freight equipment. I like their tool storage, but their equipment, not so sure, right? Always. <laughs> That's what they run at Cerakote, right? And it turns out you look at pretty much every Cerakote Pro in their shop and they're running it and it's working good so far. I had to decide where to mount it. I decided to drill right into the concrete and mount it to the floor because that thing's job is to shake. And if you mount it to a bench or if you mount it to a wall, it's gonna make noise, it's gonna shake, you know? And I thought, hey, this is also a space efficient thing in my small Cerakote paint booth. So that is, that is really good and it's, it's working awesome. I also greatly enhanced the lighting. I've got LED shop light fixtures now all the way around. And you know, coming from a professional auto paint background, I used to do complete paint jobs. I know that if you can see the paint going down, you can do a proper job applicating. If you can't, it's kind of a crapshoot as to whether or not you're gonna get a good result. So seeing is everything. And now I can see, and I really enjoyed that, sprayed two coats. I wait about five minutes between each coat. And then after the second coat, there's a 50 minute, 50 minute flash. And then it's into the Light Armor LA2500B oven. And again, if you use the oven 125 code, that's gonna get you $125 off any Light Armor, Armor oven purchase that includes a circulating fan, which you need for Cerakote. So, if you're looking for an oven, go buy it today because this thing is absolutely the best deal going. So I baked for two hours at 250 degrees and let it cool down overnight. Then it was time to put the rifle together. And for this, I used the Short Action Customs modular barrel vise and torqued it down to 90 foot pounds. I had a very particular sequence in mind when it came to this barrel work. I knew I wanted to selectively apply Cerakote. I didn't want it anywhere where it wasn't needed. I needed to torque the barrel down before doing any engraving so that I knew how that, that needed to be oriented and clocked on the barrel in terms of angular. 
And then I also knew I needed to torque the barrel first before I clocked the brake because this uh, does not have the blind nut. It's not self-timing. This is one that you have to cut on the lathe. So I did the entire Cerakote job. I torqued the barrel down. I took the brake off. A little cracking sound when you break that Cerakote line all the way around, but it's super clean when it's done. This turn worked out really, really well. I had cut a step down on the end of the brake where it comes up to the shoulder at the same exact diameter as the barrel. And I left myself plenty of room because I knew I needed to cut some off to time it. Put the brake back on the lathe. After Cerakoting, used a little blue tape to protect the Cerakote and turned off a few different turns progressively. Last pass was about a half thousandth of an inch to get it clocked just appropriately so that it could crush down to the proper torque and be aligned perfectly. So at this point, I installed the barreled action in the MDT ESS chassis. I took it down to the gunsmithing shop that I have, Precision Rifle Concepts, and proceeded to do the laser engraving. Well, it turned out I wanted to take the barrel, barreled action back out of the chassis uh, because I needed to have some freedom of orienting it in the laser engraver. So this is a 50 watt fiber laser. Uh, I, this was a sort of a two-stage engraving job. The first stage was a single line of text, deep engraved, eight thousandths of an inch deep, small text. It gives the twist rate, finished length, and ultimate reloader. Got all that engraved. And on this, I wanted to engrave both barrels with this tone on tone, just like the 1776 here. I used the same settings. I wanted a larger display for which barrel is installed. So on the 7PRC, I engraved tone on tone, 7PRC on both sides of the barrel. And here we've got 338 Lapua on both sides of the barrel. And what I hope is that's just an extra sanity check. Hey, Gavin, are you putting the right ammo in this rifle? I don't think a 338 will fit in the 7PRC chamber and the bolt face is wrong for the 7PRC going the other way, but it could hypothetically push in and cause a big problem. So I thought, let's make it really obvious what cartridge we're shooting here and what barrel is installed on the rifle. Love the way this looks, love the way this turned out. Okay, so at this point, all checks pass. The free bore check, the basic headspace check, the uh, muzzle brake is tightened on, it's clocked perfectly. This is awesome. I did some, some quick test firings. This was in a snowstorm, the first five shots. Got on paper. Um, I don't really have much of an idea of what the accuracy will be, and I haven't started load development yet. I just kind of threw together a load that was, you know, a bit under max, Burger 250 grain OTM bullets, brand new Lapua brass. So everything is working, and I was really amazed at how well this Type Pro 3 works. I thought 338 Lapua, this is gonna be just insane, because I've shot 338 before, and it wasn't. It didn't feel any worse than the 7 PRC. In fact, this brake probably works so well, it felt like less recoil than the 7 PRC. Totally insane. Okay, so next steps. Uh, here's what I have in mind. I'm going to do some load development. I'm not going to deep dive on this because I want to get to long range. I want to get to long range as quickly as possible because that's the point of this. It's not a bench rest gun. This is, this is out to a mile kind of stuff. So I want to get some load development going and then get to long range shooting. You know, here at Ultimate Reloader, we can shoot out to 1,000 yards with steel that we already have set up and then we're going to have to figure out where to go to shoot, you know, a little bit further than that. I think we can set up steel at a mile here if we do enough hiking and figure out logistics. In fact, in both directions we can. I've already lasered that. So we have some work to do. Uh, I'm really looking forward to just getting out to ELR distances with this thing. I think it'd be a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, I also have the Banish 46 suppressor. So I'll put that uh, 3 quarter 24 direct thread mount on there, get it going and see how that works with this, this rifle. I think that'll be really cool to see. Uh, and then looking at different components and stuff. So my question to you is, first, what do you think of this build and what do you think of 338 Lapua? And then second, what do you think I ought to do with this project? I just talked about some ideas, but I'd love to hear your input. Whatever the case, 
make sure you're subscribed with notifications because you're not going to want to miss any of this upcoming action. That concludes this video and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, where we've got unrestricted content, and Instagram. Make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities, including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're gonna to wanna to go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you're interested in becoming a professional gunsmith, check out the Sonoran Desert Institute. They've got a degree program, they've got a certificate program, and you can study from home. Learn more at sdi.edu. Thanks again for watching.